Okay, let me just begin by saying how honored I am to, to be able to sit on this panel today. Um, this uh, general topic is uh, a passion of mine. Uh, it's been sort of the focus of my, my career, cybersecurity. And it's certainly a, a timely topic. Uh, just pick up a newspaper and you know you'll you'll read something of relevance uh, in in this domain. So I'm hoping uh, this panel engenders a lot of thought and and good questions. But um, before I get started, yet let me introduce myself a little bit and talk about uh, where I work. Uh, as Rama said, I'm the chair of our computer science department at, in the Tandy School of Computer Science at the University of Tulsa. Um, I've been doing research in cybersecurity for well, roughly 25 years um, back as a grad student, and beginning, and my area of emphasis is attack modeling, uh, especially when it comes to cyber physical systems, um, which includes industrial control systems and OT networks and, and things like that. And I work with a, a fantastic collection of talent, um, faculty and students alike. Uh, I come from the University of Tulsa, and we've been doing cybersecurity for well over over 20 years. Uh, we have uh, long-standing relationships with uh, all the three-letter acronym federal agencies, including NSF, NSA, and, and the Department of Defense. Uh, there's a program that we have at TU called CyberCorps, which is maybe a, a crown jewel for us. We uh, Through it, we've sent over 400 of our cybersecurity graduates to work uh, as professionals in, in the federal government. Um, we, uh, we treat cybersecurity at TU like the cross-disciplinary field that it truly is, with faculty coming from all across campus, uh, including electrical engineering, psychology, law, business, um, uh, and other departments. Um, we are one of a, a handful of schools um, in the country that, that holds all three of NSA's uh, Center of Academic Excellence designations in cyber defense research and also in cyber operations. And I think the last thing I would say about our program is uh, it's a great place to come in to get a degree and specialize in cybersecurity. We have a master's degree program, uh, which is online in cybersecurity. Uh, we're just now standing up a bachelor's of science in cybersecurity that's going to be ABET accredited. Uh, and then we have a new PhD in cyber studies. And so th this again is a wonderful place uh, to, to look at cybersecurity. Um, but why are we here? Well, in my personal opinion, we're here because of Stuxnet. Now, maybe I'm a little biased, but uh, maybe some people in the, in the audience remember or are familiar with Stuxnet. This was an attack that happened just over 10 years ago. Uh, I think it was something of a harbinger or uh, maybe it's even been called a blueprint for future attacks on industrial control systems. Uh, the attack was targeted and it was incredibly selective. Uh, it, it only struck centrifuges at a specific, well, the Natanz nuclear facility in Iran. Incredibly sophisticated Swiss Army knife of an attack, multi-step, uh, most alarmingly, it featured five zero-day exploits. And for those of you that don't know what that term means, uh, essentially, a zero-day exploit is an exploit that's based on a vulnerability that hasn't been previously recognized or seen in the wild. And so it takes some creativity, sophistication, uh, and resources to come up with a zero-day. Um, but but this, this attack had five of them. It also included elements of reconnaissance, stealth, uh, and I think it even included a fiscal break-in to steal digital certificates to pull off the uh, last mile part of the attack. The inescapable conclusion of Stuxnet was that a, a nation state uh, had to be responsible for it, and the United States and Israel were sort of the prime suspects uh, in, in this event. Uh, the event, as they say, changed the game, or at least maybe it made us aware that a new game was being played. So I think that's why we're here. Um, uh, a lot of other things maybe don't happen if Stuxnet doesn't happen. But fast forward to the Colonial Pipeline attack, which has been in the news recently, uh, wherein ransomware infected the IT systems of the largest fuel pipeline in the United States. As a side note, my, my father actually worked on the construction of that pipeline as a young man. But um, the interesting thing to me about this attack was the cascading effect that we 
that we witnessed. Now, the attack really only hit the IT systems, as far as we know. Colonial actually shut down the pipeline over fears that the OT network had been compromised, which is probably a wise decision. But if you think of the result, uh, long lines and shortages at the pump, it really affected a supply chain um, uh, in, in a pretty bad way. So we have to remember that the world is watching um, uh, uh, with how we cope with these types of events. And this also informs us that Colonial was perhaps worried about the way that their IT and their OT networks were, were bridged. So um, we're, we're just now seeing um, uh, more and more of these types of events, and it almost feels like a dress rehearsal for something larger. Um, so what one question might be, what does the future hold, right? I, I believe that we can count on two things. One, that our adversaries will continue to do what works, uh, and they'll learn from each other. And so ransomware works, unfortunately. But our adversaries will also learn from how we respond uh, to attacks and, and adapt their tactics accordingly. And unfortunately, from what we've seen recently, they've got a lot to work with. Next slide, please. Uh, and so uh, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this slide, uh, but but just to point out the similarities and differences between IT and OT networks. IT networks manage data and OT networks manage physical processes. And, and you know, when we're protecting them, we're after the same core properties, um, namely confidentiality, integrity and availability. Uh, but we may be looking for them in different proportions. Availability may be more important than confidentiality in an OT network and so forth. But uh, in addition, it's it's fair to say that the underlying technology is different. The things that we're trying to protect are different. The environmental and the temporal aspects of it, the constraints that we have are remarkably different. And so there are challenges. We can't just take the exact same medicine and directly, without thought, apply it to OT security. Um, in addition, the field of OT security is less mature. And so we've been doing IT security for a whole lot longer, and I hope it's obvious that the stakes are higher. So uh, this next slide is all of cybersecurity in one slide. If you were to put a gun to my head and tell me to do that, this is the slide I would come up with. And it really is uh, just about the basics. Um, if you look at this cube on the right, it's got three dimensions. The first dimension deals with information states. Uh, information can be in a state of uh, transit, it can be at rest or it can be under process. And we, we have to recognize that we have to protect it in all three of those states, right? Whether it's an IT piece of information or data or an OT uh, piece of information or data. The dimension up top, the security services one, tells us what we're after. What are we, what are we trying to accomplish uh, with our protection schemes? Well, I mentioned confidentiality, integrity, and availability, the classic triad. This cube adds a couple. Uh, of elements, con uh, it adds, uh, in, I'm sorry, it adds availability, no, it adds non-repudiation and authentication. And so um, those are core ser services that we would like to have. The third dimension really talks about the types of countermeasures that we can use to address these properties or achieve them. And you know, here's the interesting bit, it's not all about technology. We typically think about technology as our go-to, but it's gotta be supported by policies and procedures and it's got to be supported by an investment in people. So that's, you know, that's anything that you do in cybersecurity really ought to fit within that cube uh, in, in one of those cells. The second major point, um, I'm sorry, can you go back just for a second? Uh, the, the, the second major point is that security is a risk management process. Uh, and we can quantitatively think about risk as the product of likelihood and impact. And so any control you put in place you want to um, you want to make sure that you're doing something to lessen the likelihood of an adverse event, and or lessen the impact that it would have on your organization. And then at the end of the day, uh, you have to realize that there is this thing called residual risk. No matter what you do, because you don't have infinite resources and time, you're going to be left with some element of risk, and you've got to understand what that is. Okay, uh, thank you. So. When most people think about security, uh, it's usually in the context of operations and management, and which means dealing with security while the system is up and running. But 
the best security starts well before then. And actually it happens throughout the system development life cycle and it should obey a number of core principles like least privilege or economy of mechanism, which is just the keep it simple, stupid principles. So they're a collection of those. And just as weaknesses can crop up at all points in a system's construction, from its conception to its architecture and design to its implementation, security processes and controls should be embedded or can be embedded in those same points all along the way. It should be considered as part of the design process. It should be considered in implementation because those are obviously different things. And then as it's being tested, there ought to be security testing uh, and validation and then as it's fielded and, and being operated as well. So a good security engineering process is gonna follow that all along the way and integrates assessment all along the way. And this is where we need to be with our OT networks and, and systems. Uh, next slide, thank you. And so, you know, I, I, I'm not, uh, there, there's a lot of work to do and I'm not trying to paint a, a doom and gloom picture, there, there's some reason for optimism uh, that we'll be able to, to rise to the occasion to these many challenges. And I think, I think the domain will be challenged, but it starts with awareness at all levels. Uh, and I don't think we're in a bad place here. I believe that, uh, that this has the attention of the federal government. Um, uh, and it, it seems that they're willing to uh, uh, invest their resources and energies in, in meeting the challenges. Um, at, at the next level down, organizations need to show uh, their priorities and back them up with budget. Uh, and, and I believe that that is happening um, to, a, to a greater degree as well. And then lastly, the front lines, the employees truly have to buy into this culture of cybersecurity. And that begins with awareness and education literacy campaigns. Uh, now, OT, as I mentioned, security-wise, is lagging uh, where IT security is, and of course, it's being pushed forward with the promise of benefits from data analytics and so forth, and there's some hazards there, but, but in terms of the maturity of OT security, we're making up some pretty good ground here rather quickly, uh, and it's clear that while not everything directly applies, there are things, there are ideas and notions and strategies that can be leveraged from the IT side of the fence to the OT side. This though um, is inevitably gonna take a little bit of time. And then lastly, um, as an academic, uh, I feel uh, compelled, uh, or I would be remiss if I didn't promote the role of research here. Uh, this is kind of our bread and butter at, in, in universities. But you know, I believe that um, there are uh, funding vehicles in place and projects underway that will incentivize us to invent new security technologies uh, that can be embedded within OT equipment uh, to make them more secure. And then also uh, on a macro scale or a larger scale, studying techniques by which we can just build uh, more resilient systems. So I guess my final message would be take heart. Um, the challenges are there. There's a lot of work to do, but I believe that we're walking into this with our eyes wide open. And with that, I guess we can go to my last slide, uh, which just shows my contact information. I'm certainly more than happy to continue our conversation or visit with anybody um, after the panel. And so uh, email is probably the best way to, to reach me. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to our uh, next speaker unless there are questions. Yeah, we haven't received questions yet. So Rama, if you'd like to introduce the next speaker. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, John. Uh, good intro. I think uh, people are going to take away some um, um, lessons from there. Now introducing uh, Rob Scott and Katie Elson from Bechtel. Bechtel is a, a major EPC contractor and they have a, a cybersecurity practice. With that, I'll hand it over to Rob and Katie. Rob and Katie, can you introduce yourselves? 
Thanks, Rama. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Katie Pearson. I, Rob and I work together in Invectal Cybersecurity Program. I've really been leading up the um, implementation of cybersecurity practices for OT environments and in Invectal's work processes for the last five years. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here to share some of our, our knowledge and experiences with, with the audience. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Rob Scott, and I work for Katie. <laughs> That's not entirely true, but <laughs> I'll, I'll go with it. So um, I'll, I'll start. Um, I'll start here, kind of talking a little bit about the threat environment, and and um, you know, I think Dr. Hale gave a good introduction and, and talked some about Stuxnet as as kind of the the first um, real big. Um, OT cyber event that is that has kind of driven the the investment in in OT cybersecurity um, over the last you know approximately 10 years. But really, um, on this slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we've seen over the past 10 years. Is there's really been an increase of attacks at industrial control system environments that are you know discussed in the news and, and things like that. And and we're really only seeing an increase in the overarching threat environment. And another part that's important to remember from the threat perspective is as the uh, quantity of uh, attacks have been increasing, the impacts of those cyber attacks in the OT environments has also been increasing. So I think it's important that, you know, from an awareness perspective, as, as Dr. Hale said, folks are becoming more aware of this and understanding the importance of addressing cybersecurity, you know, upfront in design of, of major construction projects. And, and um, we'll continue to see see kind of the threat environment change over, over time. And, and we're, as, a, as an industry, we're just going to have to be able to adapt to those overarching threats. Um, and, and understand that this is this is just going to be part of, of the way we have to do business in the construction industry going forward. So our focus uh, with our industrial control system cybersecurity lab has been to approach it in a cross disciplinary manner in the same way that Dr. Hale discussed. In other words, it can't just be ISMT's responsibility or operations responsibility or the engineer's responsibility to manage or address the cybersecurity risks. Because ultimately, as many of you know, what started to happen in the last uh, 10 to 15 years is the ITOT convergence or the integration of data that's available from IT and OT that can be married or linked to a tag in a model for a piece of equipment has increased. The, the ability to do that has accelerated tremendously, particularly in the last 10 years with cloud computing technology. Edge computing is becoming uh, more and more available. And we see this from what has been happening in manufacturing, whether it's cell phones or cars or pharmaceuticals, that those technological advances have been transitioning into industrial engineering or industrial engineering and construction that we do. And as Dr. Hale said, the, the probability used to be low that something like this would happen for operating technology, i.e. Uh, project logic controllers or SCADA systems, industrial control systems, equipment, it was pretty low, but now you're able to put sensors on that equipment and air gapping is no longer the default method that's going to work because just like you, the owner operator, you, the designer of record or the maintainer can put a sensor on it. It's also able, that also means that an adversary can put a sensor on that. So what we focus on with Invectal is the digital physical integration of the data from both IT and OT, working with our technology partners in order to provide unique solutions to the customer that enable them to do two things. If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, those two things really come down to resiliency and efficiency. And that's the voice of the customer, whether we are talking to government customers and in the intelligence community, the Department of Defense, uh, Department of Homeland Security, Veterans Affairs, it all comes down to how is it that I integrate these disparate original equipment manufacturers or OEM systems with into my IT network, I get the data into the cloud, 
and not create greater vulnerabilities or at least vulnerabilities that I don't know exist. And so that puts us into zero day vulnerabilities that Dr. Dr. Hale discussed that no one's seen before. And ultimately an adversary, whether it's a competitor or a, a bad actor, a criminal actor or non-state actor, if they have the people, the time and the money, they'll find a way to be being creative. They'll find a way to penetrate uh, a system. So how are how is it that we can work to be both efficient and resilient because you can't be strong everywhere? And those are also the same things we've heard with our customers in mining and minerals, energy, and infrastructure. And talking with the original equipment manufacturers and tech providers, we've also discovered that things are accelerating so quickly that this can't be a sole solution that one organization uh, advertises that they can do. It really, and it takes a village. It, it's cross-functional, it takes technology partners, and you have to be able to work together to address the environmental, social, and the government frameworks and requirements that are starting to emerge today. So we think that the only way to address this is working with customers, working with technology partners, startup companies, in order to address the ITOT convergence, which really is this internet of things in an industrial space, because ultimately the customer asks us one thing, I have my data, now what do I do with it? And so if we can help the customer manage things that are low probability to occur, while well, by increasing the resiliency, but also increase or improve the efficiency of their plant or their asset so that they can meet these environmental, social, and governmental requirements or work within the framework of risk management, then the customer is able to do more and we can help them in that manner. And an example that Katie will walk you through on our next slide is what we learned from doing a uh, solution set at the Pueblo Chemical Agent Destruction Pilot Plant, or PCAP. You can Google PCAP, P-C-A-P-P. -P. And this is a $2 billion facility that we built with several partners starting in 2003. It was designed, started to put it in operation in 2016. It's to destroy 2,613 metric tons of mustard gas in shells as old as World War I. And it, it required first of a kind robotic processes and automation. It had 50 different digital systems or more, 40,000 assets in the computerized maintenance management system, 300 screens, 43 PLCs, and 14,000 different input outputs. But we were having trouble getting that thing to operate efficiently to meet treaty obligations. So with that, I'll hand it over to Katie. Thank you. So I'll talk a little bit here, kind of as, as Rob teed up, um, a little bit about our cross-functional approach to um, cybersecurity as well as leveraging data. And, and it really comes down to understanding, you know, this, this represents a, a very high level um, control system architecture drawing from level zero down here at, at field devices all the way up into a business network here at level four. But the, the key to understanding how to address security in, in the upfront design is getting the, the cross-functional input from, you know, your design teams, your startup teams, your maintenance teams, your, your operations teams, and understanding how they intend to operate the plant and how they intend to use the data. If you're not designing a facility um, in the beginning to leverage that data, you can't really address the security aspects of it and ensure that you can um, securely get data to the right end users to make those decisions. I think, um, you know, over time, we've done a very good job and, and, and at any facility, you know, across any different customer set and, and any other EPC provider of, of delivering a control system that works. But how do you integrate that into a larger environment where you can leverage that data in a secure fashion. So understanding the different needs and the use cases really helps you understand how to, to change the architect of a control system to support those needs in a secure fashion. Um, so really understanding what data is available and how you're going to use it throughout the different environment. As you
you move up this stack, it's really looking at how, how is a control system deployed today and, and how are you getting the operator the information that they need to make the on, you know, the, the just in time decisions um, in, in how the plan is operating. But as you move up, it's how do you support and enable security monitoring so you can understand what is happening from a security perspective in your network. And then as you move up, how do you move data into a business environment so customers can make better informed decisions around maintenance, around sustainability goals, and things like that. And I think, you know, Dr. Hale had introduced the idea of baking in security, and you can really only bake in security um, in the upfront design if you start thinking through what are the different use cases for your data and how are different folks going to want to interact with this data so you can give an architecture that will support those needs uh, throughout the life cycle of the plant. Um, also, I, in, in one of the future session or one of the future panelists is really going to talk about, you know, the, the concept of, of using a secure or a safety culture in, in the security environment and looking at risk in, in terms of um, how are you going to deploy those various security solutions. So once you understand how data is going to be used and what your security requirements are, you can start analyzing risk to the various individual systems. You know, as, as Rob mentioned, um, you know, at, at any project Bechtel is built, you, built, you could have 50 different systems. Not all of those systems are as critical and require the same level of security protection as the others. And so how, once you understand the, the use cases of, of your data and how your, how your architecture looks, you can start then kind of segmenting things out and applying security from the upfront design space in a way that makes sense based on the overall criticality of those individual and unique systems. Um, and as well as the likelihood um, of, of a security incident, you know, impacting them based Based on the, the remote access requirements and things like that that you've deployed. So when we think about security, it's really what, what are in, in our OT systems, how are we going to use those OT systems, not just to operate the plant, but to, to leverage the data from them to make better informed business decisions um, going forward. And then how can you deploy something that makes sense based on your risk your risk profile, as well as your ability to invest in solutions. Um, I think, you know, Dr. Hale had mentioned you, 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 there's always a residual risk. And so if you can start managing that residual risk over time, as new threats are identified, if you understand your architecture and have, have really developed a risk-based approach to instituting security requirements, it'll then allow you to quickly manage and adapt to those security re requirements and be resilient in, in the future to, to the um, changing nature of the threats. Um, and again, leveraging the integration in various different technology partners, um, there's, there's lots of different suppliers of, of great tools out there, um, and how can you integrate those across, across your system becomes really important and, and make this really a collaborative approach to addressing security in, in the construction world and in the design world before you even go into construction of your OT systems. So here's Rob's and I contact information. Of course, we'd be happy to, to talk a little bit more about our approach going forward. Um, and if there's any questions um, you know, that, have, that have come up, we'll, we'll take them now. Katie, I think there is one question from Koela. Uh, okay. Where do the EPC construction systems fit into the IT OT differentiation? While not straight OT is similar in, in that downtime is a larger consideration than the loss of confidentiality in the risk analysis. Yeah, so I mean I think I think there it really becomes understanding what your what's your secure or what your what your risk tolerance is for those OT systems. And you know, the the processes we've gone through, um, we're definitely seeing that the um, that the downtime is is usually the driving factor, and and it's really why you need to start thinking about the unique individual systems that are integrated throughout your OT environment, how they interact, and what are those systems that are most critical. I think there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from safety analysis that have been done in terms of how do you build in redundancy, and and other things that can help you address those those um, loss of downtime considerations from a security perspective, and and to, deploy technologies, I think one of the, the biggest lessons that we've kind of learned is many times the best way to address security threats isn't necessarily another firewall. It may be thinking about different process design features that you need to include in your facility um, such that you can address that downtime issue and allow you to you know, focus on, on responding to a security incident while also not taking your plant, your entire plan offline, but rather being able to isolate certain sections of it to address those security issues in, in terms of that. Um, 
So, you know, I, I can only speak to, to Bechtel and how we think about things from, from an EPC perspective, but really our approach is understanding kind of the interactions and as well as the criticality of the different systems and ensuring that we're, we're thinking about that risk profile and working with our customers to understand what their risk profile is to, and, and coming up with unique solutions in, in, in the different cases to address those concerns. Understood. Um, this is a question from me. Uh, what about legacy plans? I mean, there are quite a few legacy plans that are being updated, modified, added on, things of that may change in function. Uh, similar processes apply to the legacy systems as well, I would imagine. It, absolutely. Um, you know, whether you're working on a new build or a legacy system, you're going to take a risk-based approach. And and sometimes, you know, with the legacy systems, you understand already kind of your operating profile and you understand, um, you know, how data is being used and, and traversed. And, and in a lot of cases, you also understand what equipment currently exists. And so there's information on, you know, threats and risk profiles and, and things like that of, of those systems. So it really allows you to do kind of a deep dive approach into the, the, the various risk profiles. But again, it's all about understanding, you know, how your system is set up, how people, how threats can, can penetrate into your system and how they can propagate against your system, and then developing the appropriate, um, you know, requirements and risk mitigations throughout your system based on that overarching risk profile. Excellent. Thank you very much. If there are any, any other questions, let's save them to the to the end, we will have a, a session where the entire panel is available to answer the questions. With that, I, uh, I see that uh, John Palm has uh, John Palmer has joined us. Uh, John, would you like to introduce the the next presenter? Yeah, thanks, uh, Rama. And um, our next speaker is Robert from uh, Kratos um, with some fascinating information on this topic. Go ahead, Robert. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be speaking with you guys today. Uh, at this point, some of you may be wondering, you know, where do we go from here? Uh, there's a lot of interesting information about cybersecurity, some, some threats that we've covered, and you know, a lot of daunting problems to overcome. Um, so my message in a nutshell is that you'll be able to apply safety culture to cybersecurity um, by taking a risk-based approach, and I'm gonna kind of walk through that today. Um, a little bit about Kratos, uh, we are, uh, Defense contractor, we build a lot of awesome systems, we build them the right way, um, but we also do a lot of consulting and assessing and uh, advisory work on cybersecurity systems. Um, and that includes, oops, one second here. That includes, um, you know, some engineering and architecture services. I actually lead up those teams in our division. Um, and we have, you know, we help organizations solve practical problems and do assessments, including some of the largest uh, names in networking and, how, and cloud compute, uh, in addition to hundreds of smaller companies that we just help try to have this risk-based approach. Um, so as far as myself, I've got a penetration testing background, just validating security uh, from a practical approach, just simulating adversaries, seeing if the, uh, the security on paper holds up to security in practice. Um, principal cybersecurity consultant, and you know, it's one of my passions to help companies succeed in, in practical ways. Uh, I'm going to start off with a uh, tale of two errors, um, and this is based partly on a um, real-world example and also a ransomware campaign that um, I have run in the past. So, you know, we're going to talk about a site crane, and we've already had a safety blurb. Um, Rama introduced us to the uh, the lockout tagout. Um, at bottom line, the, the site crane had a flaw in one of the struts operating it would have been dangerous. Um, there was a, an operator that didn't get the memo and they, they didn't check their, uh, they missed the email alert that went out. Somebody didn't actually send a text message um, and they didn't check the, uh, the normal email that comes out with a PDF schedule. So they arrived on site in the morning and got to the crane uh, only to find that the thing couldn't power on because of the, the safety lockout. Um, and, you know, the question here is, why do we do this safety lockout? I mean, don't we trust our workers? And, you know, somebody coming on who's new might ask that question. But the truth is, it's the awareness of human error, and it's an appropriate practice to keep um, a simple mistake from causing catastrophic damage um, and, and possibly loss of life on a work site. Um, so let's talk about this same person then a couple months later. They've committed to doing better to check their email 
Um, so they actually see an email labeled emergency schedule changes with an attached PDF a couple months later, and they, they download that. Uh, there's a, a small error that pops up, and they don't really realize that that email is a clever fake. The attachment's malicious, and his workstation is now running an attacker-controlled program. So the, the program itself at this point, um, the, there's no restriction on what that computer can access except anything that that user's account can touch. It begins grabbing all the different files that it can access, all the different you know, email messages, everything that it can get from both the workstation and then spreading out into the network. Um, eventually, the, the, um, all of the project files, all of the accounting files, everything is reduced to random noise that can only be reversed by a special key that, of course, the attackers aren't going to give unless there is an expensive ransom paid. Um, so this caused expensive delays, um, and moving on, uh, this, this caused a, a great deal of damage, you know, to the, uh, the company itself. So, you know, we kind of came to a grinding halt as far as the project goes because none of these systems are working. So in addition to that expensive ransom, there were also these cascading complications that came with it, right? Um, the point here is that it's not right to allow a simple mistake to cause damage. Again, it's that same principle with the lockout station. Um, so, you know, we, this is exactly what we're doing to most of our workers with their email. You know, if we have flat network architecture and poor security hygiene, one misstep and then their action is resulting in widespread damage. Uh, so, you know, social engineering attacks should not lead to a successful ransomware campaign, and the way to accomplish that is by layering defenses in place and taking a different approach to access and security throughout the system. Um, before we get into some details, I want to stress that, you know, the industry is, the construction industry is closer um, than many people might realize because of the risk-based approach that is taken for personnel safety. Uh, you, you do have the cultural tools to be successful in managing cybersecurity with, with a little bit of assistance. Um, so, you know, looking to that track record, because the, the construction industry has, over the course of the last hundred years, and even the last, you know, couple of decades, improved safety by leaps and bounds. That wasn't always the case, right? Um, so, I'm confident that we can assist people applying that same process of risk management to cybersecurity with great success. Um, one of the best resources, and there's a number of different frameworks out there, but I like this, uh, the cybersecurity framework from NIST. It's a fairly practical approach to managing cybersecurity risk. Um, so NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, they, they published this. You can kind of search for it online. And it's got a lot of um, terse language, but at the end of the day, it's a fairly straightforward approach to getting cybersecurity right for organizations of any size. Um, you can implement this in small and reasonable portions for wherever you're at and then begin to, you know, down the journey of maturing your cybersecurity stance over time. Uh, the basic process, we've got uh, a risk evaluation that will go down. You'll pick controls to bring that risk to a tolerable level. You'll eval evaluate how effective those controls are being. And then, you know, you repeat uh, year over year to have an ongoing maturity. Um, so, you know, many in safety compliance are aware you'll have a safety plan. It'll be tailored to the different risks on the site. We're going to have a security plan in the same manner. Um, so NIST breaks up, it, um, you know, the different stages into five different categories. And so some of these are you know, practices, other than our technologies that are implemented, you know, controls. Um, but this process basically covers how you would address cybersecurity risk. And we're going to talk today about ransomware and specifically that same company um, fixing their ransomware issues. Uh, so going to this first identify um, slide here. Uh, so first of all, don't be uh, put off by some of the, the terse language. You know, uh, this is one of the areas where professionals can be of help cutting through that um, to get to the practical application. But the underlying concept should be familiar. I'm just kind of walking through this. First, asset management, you're going to get a picture of what you're trying to protect. Instead of just personnel safety, we're going to add in data, devices, systems, networks, et cetera, um, to just the things that we're aware of and that we want to protect. Um, second, we're going to try to understand our own priorities. You know, what is our mission? What is important to us? How much tolerance do we have for risk? So, you know, for personnel safety, we have a very low tolerance for access, right? And we want to adopt that same principle for cybersecurity. Um, as far as 
the governance box, we're basically just saying that we want to understand our own historical intent in the past, and then if there are any externally imposed obligations. Um, so if there are compliance requirements, and there may be new compliance requirements coming down after the pipeline um, breach, you know, you'll have to incorporate those. So once we've gathered all of these data points, then we do this risk assessment, which is simply answering the question, how susceptible are we to a given list of threats? You know, what are the things that can go wrong, whether they're perpetrated by nature or actors or any of the other things that might go, go wrong with uh, systems from a cyber standpoint? Um, and then we ask, how does that risk line up with our goals and priorities? Right. So the next portion after that is our risk management strategy. We want to find cost-effective controls to bring that risk into tolerance. Um, this protect um, portion is where we kind of you know, apply different controls, and we'll talk about some of the ones that we'll select for ransomware in a minute. But you know, for example, the lockout station would sort of tie into this first box around access control. Uh, so you know, we want to look at you know the data in a very similar way. The, the trust that that workstation was, you know, it was a zone of trust where if you had access to the box and you had access to every file and without needing to confirm who it is that we, uh, you know, we're looking at there. So the, the lockout station, instead of saying, hey, if you're supposed to be using the crane at any point in time, we'll always give you access. Instead, we come and we confirm that safety conditions are correct. And so there's a, a concept called zero trust that we're seeing in industry. And while it does unfortunately get a lot of buzzword um, blurring, at the end of the day, what we're really asking is, can we tie access to a file back to a user, an authenticated user specifically, and nothing else, right? So if, if there's someone that needs to work on a file or a resource, we give them access. And otherwise, you know, we, we want to make sure that we renew that, that authenticated state every time before we allow access. Um, we can ad apply additional conditions such that they need to be coming from a device that's fully patched and running anti-malware. Um, but bottom line is access is contingent on safety con conditions being correct. And therefore, if we do have a compromised endpoint, you know, they, they actually can't access um, everything across the network unless there's a specific authenticated session for that. Um, and that's just one example of how you could apply that lockout station principle uh, to various access control factors. This zero trust concept is, is fairly advanced, but at the end of the day, understanding what it's trying to do is not going to be difficult for anyone who's worked with this lockout station principle. Um, anyway, we're going to get on to some more controls that will apply to ransomware, but let's just step through a couple of other um, slides here. So um, let's actually go on one more to the, uh, the detect. Um, so where before we were looking at various things that would prevent problems from happening, here we're going to try to put in some, some detective mechanisms to um, understand if there are security events afoot. And then uh, the next section after that, we're going to try to figure out how to respond to these emerging incidents. So just like you might have an, an evacuation plan, you might have a safety um, a plan you're, like for specific incidents, you're going to draft up response intent and document that uh, for some of the various you know, cyber incidents that you might be facing. So, and, and you know, disseminate that and train everyone so that they know what to do. Um, and then finally, we are going to move on to this recover um, slide here. And the idea is, okay, so we're going to, in, you know, something is going to go wrong, damage is going to happen. How do we recover effectively um, with the least amount of impact to our operations and our systems, right? So covering that really quickly, let's move on to the next slide where we're going to talk about some controls for ransomware. So we've already talked a little bit about this zero trust limited access um, strategy and, you know, by strengthening identity management and then by adding in multi-factor authentication to make sure that, you know, the person who's accessing a resource is the person we think they are um, and tying those limited section, sessions to access, then, you know, we've got pretty high confidence that a ransomware attack by itself um, will have limited impact, right? Um, so finally, we're going to add in some security awareness training and make sure all of our machines are patched on a regular cadence so that, um, you know, barring nation state zero days targeted against small construction companies, which is you know, a smaller risk, um, but you'll be fairly um, okay. And then, you know, even if you're not, then we're going to be monitoring for indicators. So, you know, if there's a ransomware attack going, usually that means there's a very intense operations from the CPU and you know, on disk, and because it's got to touch every one of these files and turn it to um, turn it to random noise, uh, and so you can kind of 
look for those um, indicators and understand that there's a ransomware attack in progress. Um, and based on that, we can have a response plan where we're going to isolate nodes on the network that have been infected. We're going to try to contain um, the damage there and then prevent the spread uh, for, for the, uh, the ransomware. And then finally, um, looking to the recovery phase, making sure that we have excellent backups for the data um, that are taking snapshots in a, um, in a cadence that's going to leave the restoration in an acceptable window. So, you know, accounting might have to redo, redo some of the work for the last four hours, but, you know, no data is irreparably lost um, to the point where there's going to be lasting damage to the project or to, you know, our, our operations. Um, so layering all of these things together, you know, we actually, we eliminate most of the low-hanging fruit with our uh, controls, and then for anything that that's doesn't quite cut it, we're actually going to be able to detect, respond, and then restore from backups. Um, so there are other things that you can put in place for ransomware. This isn't an exhaustive list of controls, but these are practical controls that most organizations can implement. Um, and it will, it will set you well above um, the rest of the baseline. Ransomware itself uh, these days is sort of a commodity. So instead of targeting specific companies, they're looking for the low-hanging fruit that are going to be profitable for the ransomware campaign. Um, the, the voice of that particular customer wants, you know, targets that are juicy and um, poorly defended, and they're going to be focusing on finding those. Um, so even just taking some of this and applying it will really help mitigate the risk baseline. Um, so this can be applied um, with very, you know, in, in a very streamlined, practical manner. You're going to make sure that you document policy, document these plans. Um, but there's not a lot else that, that actually needs to be done just for the core security concept. If you have compliance requirements, um, we'll talk about that actually um, right now. <laughs> so the, you know, the, there may be more compliance requirements coming down, as I mentioned earlier. Um, moving on to the, the next little bit here. Compliance is mostly additional documentation and reporting requirements. And if you are driving towards um, actual security, then you're going to be fairly well off as far as, you know, complying with some of the requirements that come down. It's just a matter of documenting everything that you're doing, capturing evidence for that, and then reporting it up in a way that's consumable for auditors. Um, if you take the opposite approach, you may struggle. I think many people who've worked in the uh, construction industry may be aware of other companies that you know, they don't really take a, a serious approach to safety sometimes, which is very unfortunate. As I said, they focus on complying with the letter of safety compliance, and, you know, we still have accidents. So, squeaking by a compliance framework does not mean actual safety, and uh, true security in the same vein is not just, um, you know, trying to adhere to a compliance um, framework. So, the reason why we do compliance is because true security is, is uh, hard to define and measure. And the frameworks themselves are designed to be easy to measure. Um, so by focusing on true security until you meet compliance, then you have a, a high assurance of getting things right. Um, so in conclusion, along with some recommendations, I'm confident that the security industry has a, a step up on many organizations as far as managing risk just because of safety culture. Uh, so leverage that risk management mindset. Um, start with the basics. Engage with experts. You know, when people are in the industry are there to help you guys be successful. It's one of the things that I love doing. Um, so you know, we can help you understand your risk, meet your compliance requirements as you mitigate that risk, and then work towards maturity in your cybersecurity program. Um, finally, undergo a penetration test regularly. I mean, there's nothing better than you know a real world test of how your security is doing, um, and you know on paper is often not enough, so I definitely recommend that. Um, and then, you know, once that's in place, embrace new technology. You know, be confident uh, as your cyber defense teams to adopt new tech. Um, and just because something is difficult to understand doesn't mean that it isn't a great thing. Um, just engage with experts. You know, for example, if a, a leader decided that a site crane was something that they didn't understand and that you know, they didn't, there were too many ways that it could go wrong, and therefore they just weren't going to adopt that modern technology. Uh, you know, the, they would be at a severe disadvantage um, compared to other companies. So, you know, that, world, that example might be a little banal, but it's the same applies for some of the emerging technology right now that the uh, construction industry is taking advantage of. So, apply risk management, go forth, adopt.
um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you guys may have. Um, my contact information is here. It'd be a pleasure if you would reach out and, um, you know, I'll try to answer any questions possible. Thank you so much. Robert, thank you. That was great. Uh, really informative. Uh, we do have one question I, I guess I want to throw out there, but I'm going to make it a little more general than it's listed. Um, in, it's around uh, transportation risks and supply management. Uh, but I'm curious, we we live here in the engineering and construction world, which brings many people together to work on one project. Do you, do you have something, the, some advice, uh, how we operate individual companies collectively in, in terms of cybersecurity? Absolutely. So this is one of the big challenges in the defense world as well. There are tons of companies that come together um, to fill contracts and to make national security systems and so the, the logistics of that really give a lot of opportunity for there to be gaps with certain players not quite coming up to, uh, to par. So we go all the way back to the slide for um, identify, which was the blue one. The very last box here is supply chain risk management. Um, so this is the, yeah, the blue identify slide. Uh, and basically what we're doing here in this session is just asking, you know, how can we have our suppliers and subcontractors help where needed to manage our supply chain? Um, so there, the defense industry right now has come out with this new framework called CMMC, which is a cybersecurity maturity model um, that you know, places everybody in, in different categories just according to how much they're doing with cybersecurity. And some of the, the lower ones are security hygiene. That would be another... Um, excellent thing to look out beyond the, the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, Kratos is actually one of the few industries that is an authorized assessor for CMMC, so you know we anticipate being a, a player in that. But um, the bottom line is, if everyone will come together and do basic security hygiene, um, and for every uh, you know every organization under you, if, if that, you'll take responsibility to make sure that your subcontractors are following basic security hygiene, then it rolls up into a much more effective and complete security picture. Um, and, you know, we can give some real world examples for the defense industry, but I'm hoping that answers your question as far as the construction industry goes. Okay, great. Um, so thank you, Robert. That was that was really good. Uh, so I think we're going to move now on to uh, Koila from uh, Exxon Mobil. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, those were really great panelists. I think you'll see that there's a thread that weaves throughout all of our different uh, discussions. So some of our my previous panelists were kind of zooming out and having you think about the big picture. Uh, for my little discussion, I want to zoom you in on some very practical things you could do to screen your software and the vendors that provide your software that you use at your company for cyber risk. Um, so my background, um, I work for ExxonMobil. I'm in our IT organization um, and I'm an enterprise architect. Um, I did. I joined CII about a year ago. I have a lot of history in the manufacturing space, and now I'm trying to apply that knowledge into the, um, the construction area. Um, one of the things that ExxonMobil does, we have a very, um, I think we have a very robust cybersecurity and cyber resiliency program. Um, and I really liked the panelists who spoke about making it your culture, um, your safety culture. Um, we have a saying at ExxonMobil that security is everybody's business. And I'm sure many companies have that perspective. We um, uh, include cybersecurity into that as everybody's business. So everybody at ExxonMobil has a responsibility to protect our corporation from cyber attack. My role as an architect, um, I have a special responsibility Responsibility. So I have extra responsibilities. And what I'm going to talk to you today is one of my job responsibilities is to screen all new technologies that we try to innovate with. And we have a lot of technology innovation going on um, to make sure that they're safe for us to use. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so what I want you to walk away from here is how do you know if the software you use is actually safe and protecting you from cyber attack or is it making you more vulnerable? Is it introducing a new threat vector that you don't even know about? Um, so 
if we want to move to the next. Um, so I'm going to first talk a little bit about how to screen software vendors. So if you're a company like ExxonMobil and you are constantly looking for a new, better way to do your business, you might include lots of new technologies in that, you know, in those ways to, to improve. Um, but before you purchase a technology, you should take a hard look at the provider of that technology, the vendor. Um, the reason you want to do that is kind of like what, what Robert and others talked about. It's, it takes all of us working together. So even if your company has good practices to protect itself, if you are bringing in a piece of software that is not from a vendor that does not take the same level of scrutiny with cybersecurity as you do, you're introducing a new threat vector. So some of the things you want to think about with vendors are viability and sustainability. How long will this vendor be around? We love startups, um, but we want to make sure that contractually um, we have a way to protect ourselves if this vendor goes out of business or if the software gets sold to a new vendor, what is it going to look, you know, what is that going to look like? Um, there are some things you can write into your contracts and there are some simple questions you can ask vendors about what are your plans if you know you get bought out by a new company how how will my company be protected and then there's the, the question about liability if there is a cyber attack on their software that causes a problem for your company who's liable for that legally so you have to have you know discussions with your procurement and law organizations about about that contract language that's something to think about another area is secure coding practices when they write software you heard dr hale talk about how you really have to design cybersecurity and protection into the design of your software um, you heard bechdel talk about the architecture thinking about that early one of those things that that people do to make sure that the software is protected is to code it so that attackers it makes it harder for them to get into the software and insert malicious code so you want to make sure that your vendors um, know what secure coding practices are. You would be surprised at some of the things that I see as I'm talking to vendors and making evaluations, asking simple questions like, do you practice secure coding? And they don't have an answer. If you're talking to a software vendor and they don't even know what secure coding is, you might want to take a pause on purchasing that software until you can do some more evaluations. Um, what are their access practices? You know, you heard um, previous panelists talk about authentication, making sure that, you know, the person, you know who's accessing the system. Do your vendors know who's accessing their system? Do they limit privileged access? Do they, you know, do they allow check in and check out of privileged access? There's lots of things to think about there, but they should be applying all of these, these great practices like Dr. Hale and Bechdel and Kratos talked about to their own software to protect you as a purchaser of the software. Another thing is their physical and digital security practices. Do they limit access to their PCs? Are they using removable storage media? We've, shown, we've seen research that removable storage media is a really big threat vector. So we actually disallow use of that at ExxonMobil. And it's because that's a really good way for an attacker to insert malicious software into your environment. And once you're in, once they're in, they can spread. And that's how ransomware attacks get started. So you want to make sure that they are are mature in the way they think about their both their physical access to their facilities to get access to the computers and then the digital security practices and finally do they have a cybersecurity training program I've screened a lot of vendors that did not and I can promise you, if your vendors that are writing your, this software don't train their own people on cybersecurity there's a very low chance that that software is going to protect you as a purchaser so those are some very simple, practical things you can think about with the vendor, but you can't stop at screening the vendor. You also have to screen the individual software. Um, so the first thing, and all of the previous panelists talk about this, is risk analysis. You need to sit down and think really hard about what is the risk of using this system? And there was a question earlier about cloud systems versus on-prem. If you don't know what that means, cloud is using cloud software, Azure, AWS. Um, On-prem means your server is um, on your, your own, you know, your network that your company has. Um, those provide different risk profiles, so you need to think hard about that. Um, you want to make sure that the software encrypts your data, guys. It is very easy to steal a company's data 
especially when it is not encrypted. So you want to have modern encryption at rest. That means when your data is sitting, and Dr. Hale talked about this, sitting in a system. And then when it, it's in transit, you want that to be encrypted. You want all endpoints. So you think of your, your network or your company like a house. When you're protecting your house, you close and lock all the doors. You might have security systems in the windows. Make sure that all of the ways that you can get into the software are encrypted so that that reduces the likelihood of an attack. Authentication, other people talked about this. Make sure you know who is accessing the software at your own company. You don't want malicious um, attackers to get into the software because it has weak authentication. Um, and then finally, as um, and uh, one of the previous panelists talked about, vulnerability assessments or penetration tests. Assume that no software is secure and test it before you bring it into your company, um, before you attach it to your network. That allows you to find the vulnerabilities and then have a conversation with the vendor and so that they can remediate it or that you have a chance to, to close some of those gaps before you use the software. So very simple, very quick, I know, but just some, I wanted to give some practical advice on things that you can do. What I would leave you with is if you're not sure that your company is asking these questions, start a conversation with your IT department. If you don't have an IT department, reach out to one of these great suppliers of cybersecurity out there to help you get a program in place to do some of these things. My contact information is here. If you scan the QR code, it sends me an email. If you have any questions that we don't get to. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Koyla. Um, there, there is one question I, I would like to pose to you before we get to the group, and 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 that is around certification of vendors. Is there a an organization out there that companies have endorsed that gives credible certification of products or anything that you know of? Yeah, the ISO has a certification, as far as I know, and we do look at that, and that that makes us feel more comfortable if a company has this ISO certification. It doesn't mean we don't ask those same questions though. So we kind of don't trust anybody. We trust but verify. And I really recommend that uh, because they're, the, the risks are too high. As uh, people mentioned, there's a convergence or Bechtel between IT and OT. And the reason we're very, you know, we scrutinize our IT software so hard is really to protect our OT because they're so interconnected these days. So there are certifications. That doesn't mean if somebody's certified that um, you, you shouldn't ask the questions though. Okay, good, thank you. So is is there one more slide, Heather, that uh, we have as a, uh, there we go. Oh, ExxonMobil, okay. Well, so that was uh, really good from all the panelists. Um, what I what I really like, uh, anytime we have a topic on technology, it seems like we draw the most passionate people. So for all of the speakers and presenters today, I thank you because not only was your content uh, amazing and, and informative, but uh, your passion came out when you're talking around these, um, these subjects. So maybe just for a second here, uh, we could get the panelists to put their cameras on um, and, and that way people can see you if we answer. For those of you attending the webinar, um, if you have a question, go ahead and type it in and I'll get to it. Um, and while we're waiting for a question, I, I have one that uh, I, I'm not sure who wants to jump in here, um, but I'm curious around uh, the subject of response. To an event, and I wonder if ExxonMobil and Bechtel uh, has policies and and actions in place not only to recover and repair and prevent future attacks, but what do you do? What is there a plan around calling authorities? Is there a plan around notifying uh, other industries? So I, I'm I'm curious. Um, maybe Robert, Katie could start with Bechtel to. Let me know if you have anything in that regard. Yeah, I'll take a first crack at it. I think as everyone has referenced, at the end of the day, you have to have a plan so that when the event occurs, you have a playbook to operate from. And Bechtel is certainly in that category. I'd say 
you know, the world is divided into two groups, those that know they have been hacked and those that don't know they've been hacked. That's, I think the zero trust envelope is really what that means. And so we could go through and explain that, but uh, how we would respond to that. But the short answer is yes, you collaborate with, uh, you know, the Department of Homeland Security, CISA, FBI, uh, you know, different companies like uh, FireEye slash Mandiant or Microsoft, if you're working in there, Azure Cloud. And there is no safe environment, whether it's on-prem or the cloud, there was a question earlier, maybe the way you address the vulnerabilities or you assess the vulnerabilities may be somewhat different, but at the end of the day, the core process, the core framework is the same, and you have to have a response plan. Because if you're trying to figure it out once this happens, you're too late. Yeah, I think okay. As a generalist, yeah. I'd like to add to that. I mean, it's it's great to have a plan. It's imperative to have a plan. But the more valuable part of the plan is actually the planning process. What you don't want is a playbook that sits on a shelf and gathers dust. And so, you know, the, the key to this, the key to response is effective communication, in my opinion, and planning. And just like we talked about um, integrating security in the system development lifecycle, much of the heavy lifting for incident response happens well before the actual incident. You've got to build a plan, you've got to test the plan, you've got to make sure your people understand the plan so that whenever something unexpected happens, as, inevit as it inevitably will, it's almost like muscle memory. And that's kind of my, my view of it. Yeah. Well, I think okay. if you, yeah, you should look this up. I think Eisenhower said it's, it's not the plan, it's the planning. And, and that's the key yeah. thing. And rehearsals can be as simple as tabletops after a pen test, you know, like Robert said and, and Coyle referred to. Sorry, Coyle, to step on you. No, that's okay. I was just going to say we have, um, when we really started to realize the, the great risk we were at as a large multinational corporation, um, it was many years ago, um, we started both a long-term plan and, a, and then a short-term. So, you know, our short-term are things like mitigating the spread if we know that we have a server that is infected we will isolate it and take it off of our network if we know that we have somebody's computer you know a phishing attack we'll try to mitigate and and protect the rest of the the people so we have 80,000 people um if that doesn't work we do have a plan to just you know drop everybody off the network and um, that's where cyber resiliency come in. You know, when Colonial shut down their, their pipeline operation, they were out of business. So we have an entire team, a cyber resiliency team in place that has plans and they do tests and they keep everybody ready. If this happens, um, then what do we do? So we have some software and some technologies in place, and then we have people trained for every single division in our very large corporation on exactly what to do if there is an attack. Um, and then our long-term plan involves changing the architecture of our IT and OT to make it more secure. So there are a lot of things that you can do to make, take your, you know, the old Purdue model, if you've heard of that, levels one, two, three, and four, flat networks, there are things you can do to make yourself less vulnerable, um, which I know I'm speaking a different language for some of you guys, but, um, you know, that's where your IT and your OT security organizations really become your best friends, is they're going to be the ones that help you figure out how do I take my entire corporation and make it less vulnerable. Yeah. And there was a question earlier about legacy systems, and I think it's really important when you think about response, um, thinking about the legacy systems you have out there and ensuring that they're instrumented in a way that you're providing an incident response team the information that they need to perform those actions. Um, I know in the OT environment, oftentimes having the information um, available to your incident responders to know there's an event or know how to properly respond and, and, and how kind of far spread that event is, is, is critical. And so, you know, if if you're thinking about this from a planning perspective, it's really important to ensure that the folks that are going to be helping you through that incident response have the tools and the information necessary to be able to properly respond. Um, because without without information, you're you're really you're not setting them up for success in, in an incident. Great. Um, so just harking back to NIST cybersecurity framework. So they have an entire um, you know, control family section on incident response and the framework itself has a section on response planning. 
Um, so they have studied this and they have you know, a great framework for kind of coming up with that plan. Um, I've participated in incident response planning from small startups all the way to national security systems. And you know, you tailor that plan for the system at hand, um, the impact of, of each individual system, like in your, your um, appetite for risk. So it really is going to be different for everyone um, and their situation. Um, and I will hark back to that framework and encourage you and encourage everyone in the audience to engage with, you know, someone who kind of understands this process to guide you through it um, and then kind of look to that NIST cybersecurity framework to come up with a plan that works for your system. Um, I have a follow-up question here, uh, uh, Robert, is when you're doing a network analysis for a, for an existing existing system, is there like a probability of occurrence kind of an approach that uh, people do? I'm very familiar with the with the nuclear uh, industry, where you assign different probabilities. Is is that kind of a framework valid, or um, or it is not? I mean, is there is there something on that that sense where uh, companies who are looking at the results of the analysis can say, okay, that's a low probability. This is a higher probability. I mean, of course, once somebody intrudes your system. Uh, the probabilities are out of the window. Yes, absolutely. It's the, the framework itself is flexible enough, um, you know, especially because this is a risk-based approach. Once you have an understanding of, of what you're trying to protect and, and your actual appetite for, uh, you know, things going wrong, then you can apply that and figure out, you know, what the appropriate response is going to be. So, um, just as an example, if uh, the there is a, a marketing website and that website is um, subject to denial of service attacks, but the risk analysis there is that even if there was a sustained service attack that brought down that website, the amount of commerce traffic that would be interrupted would be in the range of, you know, tens of thousands of dollars an hour, um, then you don't spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year uh, to, you know, do a response plan in addition to other hundreds of thousands of dollars that you're putting in if the numbers don't line up, right? But on the other hand, if there is something that is providing safety to personnel, for example, a system that's monitoring the level of toxic gas in a workplace environment, now we're talking about something that is absolutely crucial and must not go down. So the amount of, of um, time and energy and money that you would want to throw at protecting that system and making sure that there's redundancy, making sure that nothing can happen to prevent that safety functionality from you know, being disrupted, it, the cost would you know be justified at a potentially far greater, right? So understanding what the impact of the system is, how much it will impact the business goals, mission goals, um, and just you know the the, um, the scenarios in which things can go wrong is critical to doing the response planning. Now, there may be some times when if there's a widespread incident, the the correct answer is to just bring things offline, focus on the critical systems. Um, until you're at a stage when you're in the recovery process and bringing the normal things back online, right? So it is really, it does really come down to understanding what the, the system is and its impact to be able to do an appropriate uh, response plan for it. Um, obviously, balancing out, you know, what is important to the business or the the, um, the agency or the system itself. Is that his question? Great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Rob, did just you really comment? quickly, guys. Yeah, yeah, I just want to add on to it. I, I think sometimes people get into G. Um, it, we're already doing this, whether it's safety, it's process safety. At the end of the day, identifying what the critical path of the plant is, either to operate safely so it doesn't hurt people or it's you know damage the community or that you can meet your nameplate capacity, I, I would urge you to take a look at it from a process safety perspective on how you operate. Because many of those same systems that you need to operate your plant safely are the ones that you protect in some way or be extracting data so that you can do anomaly detection in the cloud, whether for operations and maintenance, to get the predictive maintenance or analytics or for cybersecurity so that you ensure that the data is doing what it's behaving like it's supposed to behave. And I think once you're doing that, it becomes much more comfortable to people. So for example, in Bechtel, we don't talk 
talk about ITO because people just, it's hard for them to understand. But if I talk about digital physical integration and Katie starts talking about physical data to a tag in the model, our colleagues in Bechtel get it. The customer understands that. So I would just urge us to, to use language that people know and understand because it, it eases the speed of adoption. Great. Okay, we're uh, we're coming up to the end. I, I I would like to note a couple of things. One is that I want to thank the the panelists for providing some great information. Um, I know you put a lot of hard a lot of hard work in coordinating for this event, um, getting your material together. Uh, you you clearly, as I said earlier, demonstrated your passion, but also your expertise in this area. So uh, thank you very much. For those of you that uh, have attended, we will be providing the material on a CII blog uh, by next week, so you'll have access to, to the material. Um, I appreciate you attending this and, and learning a little more about cybersecurity. I also would ask that each of you uh, just ask around in your company. Um, so I think knowledge and awareness that your company has a, an appropriate plan in place uh, is 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 good. So don't don't keep all of the knowledge you've learned from today's session um, contained within yourself. Uh, spread it around. Ask the question. Point to the CII blog when this information becomes public, um, and so that more people can be informed and and learn about this topic. Um, so again, thank you. Thank you, Heather, for a great job in, in coordinating. Thanks to Jenny, uh, also at CII, for, for helping put on a great event for our members. And uh, again, I hope everyone goes forward with the information and is, and, and is safe for the, the rest of the day and the week.